everyone. My name is Shamini Kore, Director of the IMF's Institute for Capacity Development, and I will be the host and moderator for this high-level opening capacity development event at the 2021 Annual Meetings of the IMF. The theme of today's discussion is Building a Strong Post-Pandemic Recovery, the Role of Capacity Development. And we will begin straight away with opening remarks from Antoinette Sayed, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. My name is Antoinette Saye, and I'm a Deputy Managing Director at the International Monetary Fund. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event and to launch the Capacity Development Event Series at the 2021 IMF Annual Meetings. As the global economy emerges from the biggest crisis of our lifetimes, the divergent recovery that is taking hold is deeply worrisome. Countries with access to vaccines and continued fiscal support are well on their path to recovery, and those without are at risk of falling behind. In fact, many developing and low-income countries are still struggling, heavily affected by the pandemic and public finances stretched to the breaking point. Consequently, progress toward the UN Sustainable Development Goals has stalled or even reversed in many countries. Financial support from the IMF to low-income countries remains at record levels. At the same time, we are seeing rising demand for IMF capacity development services to provide policymakers with technical assistance and training in areas such as debt management, domestic revenue mobilization, public financial management, monetary and financial systems, economic statistics, and macroeconomic frameworks. We have fully mobilized our toolbox to meet this demand with a particular focus on the most vulnerable countries. During the last fiscal year, more than half of our capacity development work benefited low-income countries. As policymakers plan for an inclusive and resilient recovery, we are scaling up our technical assistance and training in preparing for the challenges posed by climate change, inequality, and digitalization. In an environment of scarce resources, the IMF's partners have been critical to meeting the rising demand for capacity development. During today's event, we will be joined by representatives from two of our major partners, Japan and the European Union. Together, we work on a wide array of programs supporting our global network of 17 regional capacity development centers, eight thematic funds, the Somalia Country Fund, and bilateral initiatives. I want to thank them for this strategic partnership that allows us to support our membership worldwide and focus on low-income countries. Last year, we also launched a COVID-19 crisis capacity development initiative to meet the urgent needs of our member countries. We recently welcomed Belgium as our ninth funding partner of this initiative. With funding reaching $40 million and with more pledges yet to come, this initiative has enhanced our ability to respond to our member countries' needs. The initiative is currently funded by Japan, Germany, China, Korea, Canada, Belgium, Spain, Singapore, and Switzerland. Let me thank all the, of the contributors so far. Over half of IMF capacity development is funded by partners, and we continue to look for ways to strengthen our collaboration with them. This year alone, we have launched new partnerships with Japan, the European Union, Germany, the United States, and Sweden, among others, in areas such as debt management, tax administration, fiscal governance, and climate action. In the coming days, our capacity development event series will focus on the key challenges countries are facing and solutions to address them. We will start with a strategic discussion on building a strong post-pandemic recovery, featuring our leading capacity delivery departments and partners. 
right after this event, we will have a presentation of the IMF's online tr learning program. Our community of participants now comprises more than 110,000 people from 193 countries worldwide. We currently have 30 online courses open to the public. In the coming days, the CD event series will feature discussions on engineering the green transformation, financing the sustainable development goals, and using now casting and big data to track economic activity. I hope that you'll be able to connect with us this week and beyond. With that, let me welcome you to this event once again and invite Sharmini Khoury, the director of our Institute for Capacity Development, to lead today's discussion. These annual meetings will be her last as staff, so I want to thank her and convey our deep gratitude for her steadfast leadership of the IMF's capacity development work over the years. Dear Sharmini, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antoinette, for those kind words uh, and for being such a strong champion of the IMF's capacity development work. We are also joined today by senior representatives of the IMF's capacity development, or CD for short, delivery departments and partners. Uh, I would like to welcome Vito Gaspar, director of the IMF's fiscal affairs department, sitting to my right. Maeta Yaga, Deputy Director of the Directorate General for International Partnerships in the European Commission, who is joining us by video. And Kathy Patillo, Deputy Director of the IMF African Department, sitting on the right side at the extreme of the table. And Takuji Tanaka, IMF Executive Director for Japan, sitting to my left. Thank you for being with us, everyone either in person or remotely. As you may know, our Fiscal Affairs Department is the largest provider of IMF CD, and its director, Vito, will now give us a strategic overview of the challenges we are confronted with and our priorities on CD in the fiscal area. Vito, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Armini. I want to elaborate on a theme that was uh, introduced by Antoinette, and it has to do with the recovery and how fiscal policy interacts with the recovery for different uh, country groups. Specifically, I will look at the response of to COVID-19 to different country groups and what kind of challenges will persist in particular for low-income developing countries that benefit from most from our capacity development efforts. So if we look at these uh, uh, charts, we see on the left-hand side that advanced economies have responded to COVID-19 quite strongly. In the bars, you have the response of spending in dark purple and in light purple, you have uh, revenues. The response has been uniformly strong. It was particularly strong in 2020, but it persists uh, in 2021, and then it declines over time. If we look now at the lines, we have deviations relative to the pre-COVID-19 uh, path, and in the uh, light uh, line below the axis, we have deviations of GDP from the pre-COVID-19 path. And what we see is that advanced economies recover to the pre-COVID-19 uh, path relatively uh, fast in 21 and 22. And towards the end of this period, they're at the pre-COVID-19 path. The primary deficit in uh, blue above the axis is almost a mirror image of the deviations of GDP, really illustrating that uh, fiscal policy has contributed to enable the health system during this crisis, to protect lives, livelihoods and 
provide lifelines to households and firms and has uh, smoothened the evolution of economic activity and employment. But now let's look at low-income developing uh, countries on the right. What we see is that the response was much smaller in this group of countries. The composition of spending did change uh, in order to support health systems and vulnerable households and firms, but other uh, spending items had to be cut uh, to make room uh, for these priorities. These countries were affected negatively by a fall in uh, revenues. And what we see in the gray line uh, below the axis is that the shortfall in GDP relative to the pre-COVID-19 path is persistent. And we see that that affects revenues in an equally persistent uh, basis. And that was the theme that I elected for my presentation here today. Low-income developing countries face severe financing constraints. They face persistent challenges on their ability to collect revenue. And that leads to a situation where they're facing dramatic trade-offs in terms of achieving the sustainable development goals, including the eradication of extreme poverty, for example, but they also uh, face uh, immediate challenges at this point in time. Now, it turns out that that links to our capacity development activities when we realize that this uh, group of countries has relatively low tax capacity measured by the tax to GDP ratio. Traditionally, the uh, fund has been uh, arguing that a threshold of 15% in terms of tax to GDP, excluding revenues associated with uh, natural resources, is a minimum to enable state capacity and so to allow the uh, country, state, to fulfill fully its uh, role in the process of sustainable and inclusive uh, development. And so this is a very important uh, priority. It was already uh, crucial before COVID. It has become even more urgent after COVID. And what is it that we do? Well, we provide capacity development in this and other areas uh, to our membership, like Charmini uh, was indicated. And as you see in this map, we provide particularly strong efforts where those efforts are most uh, needed and most uh, impactful. And we expect uh, that uh, the need uh, for our services in partnership with uh, countries will, if anything, uh, increase in the near future. A crucial aspect to uh, single out is that countries' ownership and leadership in the context of a development strategy is absolutely crucial. Thanks, Charmini. Thank you, Vito, for sharing those compelling figures and big and the big picture of what's at stake with CD in the fiscal area. We'll return to some of your comments uh, shortly. Now let's focus more specific specifically on Sub-Saharan Africa, the primary ben beneficiary of IMF CD. Kathy Patillo, uh, Deputy Director of the IMF's African Department, will discuss some of the key challenges that we are facing in the region. Thank you, Sharmini. Uh, it's great to be here and to discuss the critical role of capacity development in the sub-Saharan African region. Starting with the uh, ongoing pandemic, the region has been subjected to repeated and ever more alarming uh, series of outbreaks. The most recent actually was the largest. And as elsewhere in the world, without vaccines, the pandemic will continue and the region then will be prevented from recovering fully. 
But the vaccine rollout in sub-Saharan Africa has been the slowest in the world. You know, barely two and a half percent of the population has been fully vaccinated. So in 2021, we're expecting some recovery, which is most welcome, but the region's recovery is expected to be the slowest in the world. This is the region that needs to grow the fastest, uh, and instead the recovery is the slowest. Um, so this is going to lead to divergence. Um, Advanced economies are uh, recovering, but in sub-Saharan Africa, the region is not expected to regain the ground lost from the pandemic anytime soon. And that would suggest a persistent drop in real per capita income of around 6% due to these very different vaccination prospects, as well as differences in policy support. So the prolonged nature of the pandemic is reversing some of the very hard fought gains that countries have made in improving living standards over the past three decades. We've seen increases in you know, life expectancy, increases in you know, net primary enrollment, large declines in poverty. And these are all being reversed in some countries uh, and at, at great risk. And if unaddressed, you know, this scarring of human capital is going to amplify the economic losses and inequality. It's going to take significant financing, reform, uh, to get a considerable growth acceleration to turn these indicators back. And capacity development can play a critical role in these reforms. So in our region, policymakers are faced with a, uh, a very difficult and politically charged balancing act. First, they've got to address, you know, the region's very pressing development needs. You know, second, to contain public debt. Debt vulnerabilities have risen in many countries. And finally, to mobilize tax revenues in um, circumstances, you know, post-pandemic, uh, where additional measures can be unpopular. So targeted CD can again help address these policy challenges. To mention a few, on debt, you know, support in debt management uh, and in debt workouts, limiting risks from SOEs and, and PPPs. Uh, on the spending side, uh, CD to help with the efficiency of spending, to help prioritization, to help countries keep the receipts from uh, emergency financing. And finally, on you know, raising uh, revenue support, including digitalization then of customs and revenue administration is really helping. So um, unprecedented uh, and agile support by the IMF has been essential to our region during the crisis. Um, working with development partners and especially through our regional capacity development centers, which are in the, the countries um, and have uh, long-term experts then who know the countries, who are close to the authorities, who are often from neighboring countries, so they bring the peer learning. These centers, uh, together with our HQ support, then have been extremely agile and adapted to the new virtual environment and used that then to scale up our training and CD. So the process of building capacity and building institutions takes time, particularly in our low income and our fragile and conflict affected states. Still, we're increasingly uh, paying attention to measuring results so we can adjust strategies you know, where needed. We do see a lot of success. For example, here in, you know, in Rwanda, IMFCD um, helped revenue administration to implement digital technologies. Other things uh, also helped, but you know, tax to GDP ratios doubled in a decade. We hear strong testimonials on the effectiveness of CD. Uh, we see success narratives. And a recent working paper by IMF staff um, showed that CD does improve revenues. Now, donor funding is central to the IMF CD delivery in our region. More than half of the support is externally funded through various 
uh, modes, uh, bilateral support. We see the, the beautiful flags here from our, our bilateral uh, donors, uh, thematic support, and as Antoinette mentioned, the new COVID crisis capacity development initiative has helped fo fund more long-term experts in our RCDCs in the region. In uh, concluding then, um, you know, the outlook is worrisome, but there's so much potential in our region. And we need partnerships then for financing, reform, capacity development uh, to help with the very important investment in a region that is going to have the fastest global population growth um, and contribute then, you know, hugely to the growth of the global labor force in the next decade. Um, so we need this support to help countries build institutions so that they can increase uh, domestic revenue mobilization. Uh, they can have st strong institutions so they can deliver much needed public services and create the environment for human capital growth uh, and jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for these very interesting and comprehensive comments. As you may know, the IMF teams up with development partners to maximize its impact and create synergies with other institutions. Over half of the IMF CD work is partner funded, and we are very pleased to be joined by representatives from the European Union and Japan today, our top two development partners. Let me first introduce Marita Yeager, Deputy Director General, Directorate General of the International Partnerships uh, in the European Commission. The European Union supports most of our CD activities, and so, uh, Marita, we have you with us at a critical moment as the IMF CD work gears up to help countries recover from the pandemic. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Sharmini, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague. I uh, would like to thank you for inviting European Commission we very much welcome this initiative, and I would like to say that it's a personal pleasure and honor uh, to be among colleagues to discuss the capacity development for sustainable recovery. Of course, we hope that the globally the focus can really shift towards the recovery, but we are all aware that many countries are still fighting the pandemic, so struggling uh, really to get their population vaccinated and to try to keep their economies afloat. Because uh, we all know that the pandemic has uh, taken a huge toll on our partner countries and uh, some of them, they are even further away from achieving SDGs. So my first message to all of us should be that the greater and more uh, efficient recovery efforts are needed. And we need to work even closer together. We have a long-standing partnership with the IMF. We've been um, partnering in so many initiatives, also now in the post-pandemic or pandemic situation. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, for example, the IMF uh, CCRT, or we've been working together on the budget support. We've been uh, cooperating on the SDRs, also lending through the IMF Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, etc., etc. But we have to do many things more uh, together. But uh, I would like to say um, the second message that we really welcome that the IMF has become more responsive uh, to development priorities uh, that are also crucial for the European Union, such as uh, Green Deal, such as uh, sustainable finance, uh, also inclusive growth and uh, migration partnerships. And we do notice that the fund is really scaling up action on climate change and the gender aspect, also assessing its impact on macroeconomic and financial stability and integrating it into the policy advice. This is absolutely important for us. And also we uh, encourage you further to move beyond the core areas of IMF technical expertise and really to embrace these priorities as they are macro-critical for uh, all of us. So to build back 
better we work together with our member states and european financial institutions through team europe uh, to support partner countries for sustainable recovery as you probably know we quickly collected uh, 46 billion as a immediate response uh, to the pandemic uh, consequences and needs of our partner countries but um, there are much more that we need to do together. And I would like to mention four areas uh, where we would greatly appreciate even closer um, cooperation with you. And I would start, of course, with the climate change um, when um, it comes to supporting institutional development by demand-driven and integrated capacity building programs. We believe that this will be key to encourage our partner countries to further integrate the NDCs into their national development strategies. And also we will need people that are equipped uh, with the design uh, and knowledge how to design policies, I would say, that phase out the fuel uh, subsidies and move toward the carbon taxation. Maybe you know that in Europe we have a new MFF regulation called Andiki Global Europe, where the, our co-legislators uh, gave us a 30% target for the climate change, but um, uh, our president of the Commission now put an even more ambitious target with additional 4 billion for the climate change action, which will bring, you know, in reality, uh, the budget that our external action will dedicate to the climate change uh, to probably 35% of the budget. Next area, of course, it's health and the pandemic has exposed all the weaknesses and uh, also inequalities of the health systems. And we need to address further the health security preparedness. And uh, we would like to uh, work with you and especially in health to promote the capacity development to strengthen the, our partner countries' health systems and also to do more on the preparedness in response to the future uh, health threats. Also, we would like to continue working on the fiscal policies. Uh, they are key, uh, they are in the heart of the recovery, and you have uh, many assessment tools that we believe are very much fit for purpose, like uh, TADAT or PIMA, and we can even further use them, of course, uh, together with the policy dialogue that also plays a very important role. And um, for us, and this is my last message, it's a key, the cooperation at the country level is essential. I know that many of our colleagues are working on the daily basis uh, together, but uh, we need to even intensify this cooperation so that the ownership of the country uh, is there as well. And uh, uh, the, we cooperate uh, extensively with the capacity development through the regional technical assistance center, global thematic funds, and really uh, coordinating intervention on the ground. Thank you, Marita, for these very informative uh, observations. Let me now turn to Takuji uh, Tanaka, executive director of the IMF for Japan. Uh, Japan is the longest standing partner of IMFCD and currently its largest funding partner. Japan is also a champion of our online learning program. Uh, Takuji, could you share your perspective uh, on how CD can support a strong post-pandemic recovery? Thank you, Shamini. It is my great pleasure to be here, and uh, we're more than happy to address all of you at this marvelous opportunity. I'd like to touch upon uh, three matters today. Uh, the importance of IMF City, Japanese position to CD, and future prospect of CD, including uh, li uh, online learning, as you say. As one of three functional roles of IMF, capacity development has played an important role to help member countries enhance their institutional capacity. This is a key to implementing more effective policies to achieve economic stability and inclusive growth. Under the current crisis and the increasing divergence of uh, global economy, the deterioration of human capital accumulation is one, of, one aspect of growing inequality by the pandemic. 
Accordingly, the importance of city has been greater than ever, particularly in low-income countries. Mm -hmm. We welcome IMF's uh, rapid transition to virtual format to provide technical assistance to 160 countries after the outbreak of the pandemic. We believe that this IMF support has helped to implement appropriate and effective policy response to the pandemic. As the economic recovery pro uh, progresses, our future focus should gradually shift to longer term development while keeping implementing urgent priorities. Let me turn to the Japanese position to CD. Uh, Japan has been the longest serving partner of the IMF, as you say, uh, since 1990. Japan has contributed uh, $730 million to date to support CD project in more than 100 member countries. I'd like to share Japan's fundamental thought on what is needed for more effective and efficient IMF CD. First, I'd like to emphasize the basic common understanding for IMF CD is that they should be demand driven and tailored to needs of each member countries based on members' ownership. This is a key to maximizing the outcome of CD de delivery. Second, it is also important to strengthen the strategic integration of CD with lending and surveillance in order to build institutional capacity and achieve sustainable growth. Thirdly, cooperation with other development partners is essential to avoid duplication and to deliver CD efficiently. In addition, authorities and IMF staff continue to communicate closely to feedback to each other for achieving better result from CD. Next, I would like to turn to show the priorities of CD uh, program funded by Japan. As for the thematic priorities, it is important to strike the right balance between traditional areas and newly emerging areas. In this sense, we'd like to focus on the following four areas in the next year's program. First, as a traditional areas, public financial management and public debt management. And uh, as a new emerging issue, developing financial market, including CBDC. Thirdly, infrastructure governance related to the climate change. And fourthly, domestic revenue mobilization, as uh, Shamini said. With regards to regional priorities, we will continue to focus on Asia Pacific and Africa. Nevertheless, we are ready to continue to listen to voices of each country, and we'd like to discuss further with IMF staff to provide projects for the needs of each member country. As a third part, I would turn to the prospect and possibility of CD focusing on future IMF online learning program. We welcome the more than 120,000 participants who have completed the online learning program so far. Japan has been supporting the IMF online learning program since 2017. In this sense, it is nothing new, but pandemic has provided us with a good opportunity to reaffirm the importance of online learning and training under the suspension of physical mission. In the future, strength, strengthening the linkage between online learning and uh, technical assistance will have a good synergy to enhance to acquire the basic knowledge and expertise of government officials, both before and after technical assistance. Last but not least, I'd like to once again express my sincere gratitude to IMF staff at headquarters, headed by Shamini, and regional offices 
for their entire uh, efforts to meet the needs of member countries under the current, even current difficult situation. I would also like to reiterate that Japan will continue to work along with IMF CD efforts. As of here. Thank you very much, Shamini. Thank you, uh, Takuji, for these very uh, insightful comments. And indeed, our online program has been successful, uh, particularly in the pandemic, and very relevant. And uh, we appreciate your Japan support. Let me now follow up with some questions for our panelists. Vito, I'm going to turn to you first. Uh, you have emphasized the differential impact of the pandemic on low-income developing countries on one hand and advanced countries on the other. We also have um, a different kind of uh, divergence happening, uh, a digital divide between countries with access to solid digital infrastructure and those without. Do you see opportunities for drawing on advances in digitalization of uh, public finances, and how is uh, the IMF CD helping uh, to reduce this divergence? So during the uh, period of COVID-19, uh, we have seen the importance of access uh, to digital infrastructure and ability to use digital technology as a way to circumvent the constraints that COVID-19 put to all of us. Inside countries, you have seen that people who can uh, work remotely, who can work from home, uh, faring reasonably well. Here, for example, in the United States, people with high incomes have employment levels at this point that are already above pre-COVID-19 levels, while people with lower levels of education, lower access to digital infrastructure, having jobs that require physical presence are still very much below pre-COVID-19 uh, levels. In Africa, now going internationally, you have that access to the internet is still less than 30% of the total population, while in places like Japan or the European Union, the statistic is more than 80%. But we also saw that the pace of digital transformation, the pace of digital revolutions was much accelerated by COVID-19. And so there are many opportunities for jump-starting the process. Leapfrogging is a possibility. And we have many inspiring uh, cases, including in Sub-Saharan Africa, where digital technology was used by governments quite governments quite effectively to circumvent some of the difficulties of COVID-19. Going forward, as was clear from Kathy's presentation, for example, there are many opportunities in the area of public financial management to improve the efficiency of uh, public spending, to make sure that support reaches those who really need it, but also in terms of tax capacity. The use of digital uh, technology allows revenue administrations to have access to information on tax uh, payers that strengthens the ability to collect revenue under the current rules and to adapt tax policy to the opportunities of uh, digitalization. So I do see uh, digitalization as a very exciting domain of our work going forward. Very good. Thank you, Vito. I'm going to turn to Kathy now. Kathy, you very convincingly illustrated how the pandemic threatens to reverse decades of progress on poverty uh, reduction and learning gains. Um, and hence also, as Vito was uh, saying, progress on sustainable development goals. Um, and Vito has also emphasized uh, the importance of revenue administration for, for achieving these goals. Um, are there other areas of um, that you think uh, that the IMF CD could be particularly impactful in helping sub-Saharan Africa uh, regain progress uh, towards the SDGs? Thanks, Sharmini. Um, so um, even before the pandemic, you know, the financing needs for countries in the region to attain the Sustainable Development Goals uh, were very, very high. 
Um, we had, uh, you know, estimated that, for example, in Nigeria and Rwanda, um, that would be 16% you know, of GDP. Uh, and then with the pandemic, these costs have gone even higher because of the kind of growth scarring that I mentioned and the, the other uh, scarring. Um, so um, in addition to the key role of domestic revenue mobilization, which, which we've talked about, I think the other side of the, of the fiscal coin is equally as important. That is um, ensuring the type of spending then is most supportive then of uh, helping countries achieve the, the sustainable development goals. So this means both, you know, uh, quality of spending, um, the efficiency of spending, the type of spending, um, and CD in, in all of these areas uh, is, is, is critical. Um, they uh, go together very much with, with uh, the revenue side also. So you hear that, you know, in many countries, populations are not going to be willing to uh, contribute to, you know, paying taxes than if they are worried that they're not going to see any gains then on the kinds of services that the government can deliver. Uh, if they're worried about, um, you know, misuse or corruption or uh, poor spending or spending that doesn't get to them. Uh, so you need both sides of the, of the coin. And I think um, the, the medium-term revenue strategies that the Fiscal Affairs Department has been working around the globe and, and including in, in many countries in our region have this type of approach, which is that you need to think whole of government and you need to think first, what are the spending uh, needs that you're trying to achieve to get to your development goals and how do you have then a, uh, a whole of government uh, approach that builds support from both the government as well as the you know broader society for a strategy to to build that support for high quality uh, spending that's going to you know again um, improve people's lives Thanks. Thanks very much, Hafi. That's Can that's I very add a interesting. Thing? Sure. Um, referring to uh, our friends from the European Commission that have uh, joined us in this session, uh, the point that you were making, Kathy, reminded me the catchphrase from the European uh, Commission: "Collect more, spend better," mm -hmm. and that is crucial, and that links to a very important remark that my friend Mr. Tanaka made in his intervention, which is that the crucial element for a successful development strategy in any country is the country's own ownership of that process. The development mm -hmm. strategy has to come from the roots of the country. And our role as capacity development uh, providers, the role of the global community as a provider of finance are subsidiary to that development right. strategy. Right. Indeed, I totally um, agree with you on that. The ownership is critical uh, in, in moving forward on these things. So um, thank you, yes. Let me turn now to Takuji. Um, Japan was indeed one of uh, in fact, the first partner uh, of the IMF um, uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, CD initiative, uh, which helps uh, us meet the urgent pandemic-related CD needs um, in our membership. What are the specific areas uh, where you think urgent action is needed, uh, particularly uh, at this moment, uh, from the international community? Thank you, Shamini. Very excellent questions. And uh, we are uh, facing with the various challenges. But among those challenges, we have to make uh, some priorities to, to help the third member countries. And uh, as you said, the uh, COVID-19 uh, CD initiative is a very good opportunity and good sort of uh, uh, challenging matter. Uh, so we, in a very positive way, we tackle with this matter. 
And uh, answering to your questions, of course, uh, as, as I just mentioned, we'd like to put four areas uh, uh, importance, uh, put importance to four areas, especially the traditional, as a traditional areas based upon the recognition of growing amount of debt accumulation, uh, public financial management and public debt management is first and foremost important. And secondly, um, uh, of course, in order to tackle with uh, the challenges of the uh, so na natural disaster or something like that related to climate change, infrastructure's importance is getting higher. But uh, what is the infrastructure governance? It's uh, not uh, prevailed in many countries. So in this sense, infrastructure governance is, uh, is uh, another uh, traditionally important area. And in order to, to make uh, expenditure, uh, the expenditure side for the infrastructure is important, but at the same time, the revenue side is also important. So in this sense, of course, our effort from the sort of donor countries to provide fin financial resources is important. But at the same time, from recipient for recipient countries, the efforts to raise the uh, national revenue mobilization is most important factor. So in order to enhance the capacity of uh, revenue, uh, national revenue mobilization, we'd like to attach the importance to that. And as a newly emerging issue, as uh, Mr. Gaspar said, the digitalization is important. But uh, this is a, a bit that demand-driven factor. Every, not every country has fully recognized the sort of current rapid changing uh, phenomenon of ca digital currencies. So that's why IMF might support from a surprise side you know, uh, idea to help member countries for the enhancing the digital currency, digital money matters. So those four matters uh, right now, we are uh, paying much attention to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Puja. Indeed, there's a whole lot of areas uh, uh, that uh, I think IMFCD is indeed going to be very important uh, in, the, in the coming years uh, that we need to focus on. This strategic discussion on the role of CD in supporting a strong post-pandemic recovery is coming to an end. Let me thank once again Japan, the European Union, and our numerous additional development partners for supporting the IMF's efforts to tackle urgent pandemic-related needs and build policies and institutions to support a greener, more inclusive and sustainable recovery. I also want to thank WITO, and Kathy for the tremendous work uh, that their departments are doing to meet the increasing demand for CD around the world with the support of our network of 17 regional CD centers. With that, please join us again, if you can, at 10 a.m. today for a live event on Online Learning 360, What's in There for You? And we will be back tomorrow for our CD talk on nowcasting using big data to track economic activity in sub-Saharan Africa, on Thursday for our CD talk on engineering the green transformation, and then next week for our last CD talk at the 2021 annual meetings on financing sustainable development goals. Thank you everyone and see you again soon.